I will talk to you of art. Yes. For there is nothing else. Are you all ready to join me today in our trip to outer space? Come along quietly or not. Well, you can have all the talent in the world and never get anywhere. Some artists bait a hook and let you bite upon it. And now, without further ado... Hello, folks. This is Albert Shivers, and it's time for yet another episode of Planet Shivers. On this episode, we will be talking with Keisha Peart, who is a stand-up comedian, actress, writer, director. She wears many hats, and she's very talented wearing each one of them. Um, This interview was recorded probably over a month ago on location in Queens before all this shit hit the fan. Um, I don't really have much to say about all these cooties going around because there's really nothing I can say that hasn't already been said. I do have some opinions and some theories and some feelings about all of it, but I also don't want to sully or take any any attention away from this interview with Keisha because it's a very good conversation. I may do an extra episode just sort of talking about all this, um, get Isaac on here and get some other people on over the phone. So that could be in the works, but I'll keep you guys updated on that as it comes together. So instead, I'm just going to end it there and just provide an escape from it. I've been churning out a lot of new artwork. I just started a series of drippy ink drawings. I'm going to be doing all old spooky blues musicians, the spookiest of blues musicians. Um, So far, I've done Charlie Patton and Blind Willie Johnson. If you haven't heard their music, check it out. Um, I would point you to the song Hanging on the Wall for Charlie Patton or High Water, also Charlie Patton. And for Blind Willie Johnson, I would direct you towards Dark Was the Night, Cold Was the Ground, or If I Had My Way, or John the Revelator. Those are all good tunes for both of those guys. Um, I did the portrait of Charlie Patton late last year and called him the spookiest man in blues. And I realized that there were a lot more spooky performers in blues. Uh, Maybe they didn't set out to be that way, but they are kind of spooky. I'm going to be doing at least three more blues artists, so pay attention. Um, You can check out my art stuff right now on Instagram and on Facebook. Facebook is just Albert Shivers or Albert Shivers Visual Artist is the like page. And on Instagram, it's at Albert Shivers. I've been getting a lot of positive feedback on the last episode we put out, which was my conversation with visual artist Don Stetner. If you haven't listened to that one yet, I would definitely recommend it. And All the episodes are all there. Um, They're on YouTube. And my phone keeps going off and it keeps distracting me. They're on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, Google Play. All the places where all your favorite podcasts are is where this one is. And maybe it will become a favorite of yours. Who knows? You know, you got nothing else better to do these days. Listen to something. I don't know. So... Let's just jump right into it. This is my conversation with Keisha Peart. It was so much fun to talk to her. I hope that the positive energy that she always seems to exude whenever I see her can help to just sort of lift everybody up a little bit. And um, yeah, she's got a lot of fun stories, a lot of cool things we talk about. So let's just get to it. Oh, trouble soon be over. I have a name. Okay, folks, this is another episode of Planet Shivers. I'm Albert Shivers. 
our sound guy Isaac isn't here today, but we miss him. And I'm here today on location in Queens with actress, comedian, photographer, just a whole bunch of things. Very talented, Keisha Perp. Thanks for doing this show. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. I love doing podcasts. So, I really, I want to jump right in um, with the comedy. I'm just jumping back into that world recently, and um, I met you as an actress. Yes. We worked on a couple of short films together. And then, you know, we just sort of did our own thing. Mm -hmm. And then I see you doing stand-up. Yes. And it's always interesting to me why someone chooses to do that. And that's not like an insult. To yeah. No, 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 I get it. Yes. Uh, so, I, first of all, never thought I'd be doing stand-up, which is funny now, like two years later. Um, so, I thought about doing stand-up a couple years ago, actually. And... I, I said I wanted to try it, but I wasn't really sure if I wanted to do it. And then going into, I think it was 2017, 2017, no, 2018 mm -hmm. was the year that I decided to do things that scare me. And on that list was stand-up comedy. Mm -hmm. And so I talked to a few people. I was looking for some racks for a good open mic because since I was new, I didn't really know what I was doing. I wanted to make sure I was going in an environment that was a safe space for someone new so that they wouldn't be like scared right. off after going to an open mic. And a few people recommended this really great open mic at the Magnet Theater called Everyone is Sad. It's hosted by Perry Gross. She's amazing. So a few people were like, she's great, especially for newbies and female friendly. And so I looked up her info and I was like, all right. And I signed up and then I was like, there's no turning back. <laughs> so uh, I was like, well, I'm just going to kind of see what happens. And then at least if, if it doesn't go well, I can say that I did it with no regrets. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd been doing a lot of dating in New York, and so when I was thinking about what I wanted to do my topic on, I figured this would be the perfect opportunity to tell dating stories. And so that's kind of where I got my opening set inspiration from, was from several years. I'm still dating now, but <laughs> well, I would say like five or so years of dating in New York, and I'd been saving a lot of messages and things like that, and I decided to write a set based on that, and that's kind of, kind of how I jumped in to stand up. Mm -hmm. Now, had you done improv stuff before that? Yes, yeah, so I had done improv, I would say maybe like two or three years prior, so now I've been doing improv for about five years, and I've been mm -hmm. doing stand up for two, so I'd say about three years before I'd been doing improv, so I'd had a little, you know, I'm a performer, I'm an actor, yeah. so I'm pretty good at thinking on my feet. So it's not like I was just someone coming in from the nine to five corporate world who was just like, I'm going to do it. I've been in the arts since I was a kid, so I figured yeah. it probably isn't as scary as I think, but it was still scary. So I did have an, a little bit of an improv background. Gotcha. Who, who are some comedians that, that sort of influence you? Interesting. Um, people ask me this all the time. Um, I don't know if there's anybody that I took inspiration from specifically, but there were a bunch of comedians that I watched leading up to going to an open mic mm -hmm. because I think stand-up has evolved so much over the years. I think now it's evolved into story-based telling. It's almost like story-based yeah. with punchlines and jokes and analogies and things like that versus there are some comedians who do crowd work or there are some comedians who do impressions and mm. there are some comedians who are really good at punchlines and joke telling right. and I didn't really know anything about how to create a joke so I I didn't want to do it the wrong way so I kind of watched a bunch of stand-up the week before I went to the open mic I love Ali Wong I'm a huge fan of okay. um John Mulaney's great uh and I've been watching some other people recently I just watched um Fortune, I can't remember her last name. Hopefully she won't listen to this. Um, Fortune, it begins with an F. Uh, anyway, she was on a uh, mini project and she's touring right now. I just watched her stand up, so funny. Uh, but yeah, I think I just watched a lot of comedy to see like what are the trends that are happening. And mm. then I was like, so people are just telling stories and then they're adding in stories or they're adding in like jokes and punchlines right. and creating like little segments. So that kind of helped me streamline how I was going to put my set together. It was mm -hmm. just listening, seeing what they're doing, what's their physicality, how they're connecting with the audience. And I think it's a lot of how you connect with your audience factors 100% into mm -hmm. your set. Absolutely. But you mentioned how like comedy has evolved. One thing that I've noticed, you know, I went through a period where I was collecting a lot of 
comedy records mm-hmm. from from um, like 60s, 70s kind of thing. And I think like specifically when I think of how it's changed, I listen so now like every comedian mm-hmm. worth their blood like no has at least heard of Lenny Bruce. Right. So now you listen to a Lenny Bruce record and, and it like, kills me to even say it, but it doesn't totally hold up. Mm-hmm. Not only because of the subject matter, but because there was more time before the punchline. Mm. You know, and I've heard other like recent more popular comedians now even say that at that time the audience would let you go a minute or two. Mm-hmm. They would stick with you mm-hmm. for that punchline. And now it's it's got to be you quicker. have to be so fast on your feet. Yeah. There's I think there's a difference between like holding out like especially if you're saying a really funny thing leading up to your punchline right. and like the audience is just laughing. Yeah. And giving them that beat to get it in. Mm -hmm. But right, if you're holding it out too long, you've already lost your audience. You have to, it's very quick paced. Mm -hmm. And it's feeding off the audience with that. But yeah, I don't think you could definitely hold out for a minute or two. Your audience would be gone already. Right, right. Especially starting out when you only have those five or Mm -hmm. ten minutes. And a five minute set goes by really quickly. Well, at least Mm -hmm. in the beginning when I started, I think... At the open mic, you do four minutes. That's the open mic I started. So you mm-hmm. do four minutes and you get light the wave at three minutes, which means you wrap up. And I think f- trying to come up with the initial four minutes felt like an eternity. Like, how am I going to talk for four minutes? But then you're up there and it goes by so fast that you're yeah. just like, oh my God. So a five minute set really feels like a minute. And once you've practiced your set and you've got it down solid, it's like you blink your eye and you're like, is it over already? And then... Eventually you build up. So I've done a five minute set. I've done an eight minute set. And like now I have like a newer 10 minute set, okay. which for me feels pretty good. I did it at my show a couple of nights ago, but I think now, cause I'm still in the early stages. I've only been doing it for about two years, but I think like, Oh God, I don't know if I could do a 30 minute set. Cause right. that feels so foreign, Yeah. but I feel like the more that I get into it, I'll be like 30 minutes. That felt mm-hmm. like five, you know, right. and then you get to an hour mm-hmm. and they're like, that felt like 10 minutes, you know, it, I guess it's, the more you do it, the more easier it feels. And then it just is like, oh, half hour, piece of cake. Whereas right now, I'm like, a half an hour feels like a lot of time <laughs> to keep yeah. the audience engaged. Right. So, let's, you mentioned your Black Girl Magic show. Yes. Let's talk about that. I think you just recently had one, right? Yeah, we had one uh, two nights ago here in Astoria at QED, which is a really great venue. I love, I love that place so much. Um, and this was our third installation of the show. Um, so I created hashtag black girl magic. Uh, the first show was in July of last year. And when I first started doing stand up, I mean, it's still very much a male dominated world, but yeah. you are seeing a lot more women coming to the forefront, which I think mm-hmm. is awesome showing that yes, we're out here and we're funny. But when I would be on a show, I'd be lucky if there were more than like two or three women. Right. And if I, w- if there were multiple women, I was pretty much the only woman of color and or black woman on a show. And so the more I started going to like open mics or just being on a show, I very rarely saw black women comics, but I'm like, I know that they're out here in New York and they're really Mm -hmm. funny. And so I just kind of had this idea of like, what if I created a show to, to celebrate us and to showcase that we're here and what we have to offer and that we're really funny. So, um, at QED, anybody, you can pitch a show if you have an idea. So I Mm -hmm. pitched an idea. They loved it. I had all my stuff together. And so they gave me a slot, and then I it was up to me to look for my comics and mm-hmm. all that stuff. But the thing was, I was still very new in the comedy world. I'd only been doing comedy for a little over a year. By the time of the show, it was like a year and a half, so I still didn't know a lot of women comics at that, if, mm-hmm. and or black women comics. So once I was like, all right, I'm going to do the show, then I was like, I don't know have any comics to put on the show. Mm-hmm. But luckily, um, I asked for a bunch of racks, and I had a really we had a really awesome lineup for that first show we sold out we had standing room only I didn't know anybody in the audience so all of these people found out about nice. the show somehow either through word of mouth or maybe they saw it on the website which was really exciting because I honestly had a real fear of like what if nobody comes to the show <laughs> what if it's just yeah. us performing for like three people which you know it, it's happened when you're producing indie comedy mm-hmm. that's a very real thing that can happen but it was really exciting to see how the lineup was awesome we sold out to anyone only, and several people were like, this was one of the best stand-up shows we'd ever seen, which was, like, warmed my heart, because I'm like, I still don't know what I'm doing. I'm right. just faking it until, <laughs> until I kind of know what I'm doing. So that was pretty exciting. So we had our, our third edition on Wednesday night. 
Um, we didn't have as large of an audience, but the show was so good. The ladies killed it. And right now it's on hiatus because it's been a little bit stressful finding a lineup. Gotcha. And the last two shows we did, finding enough people to come watch the show. Because we sold out on our first show, mm -hmm. but then the second and third show didn't have as good of a turnout. And I'm, so I'm trying to figure out, like, how can I get the word out there? Like, it's... Producing is a lot of work. And you're in charge of, like, getting butts in the seats and, like, mm -hmm. promoting the show. So I'm still figuring out, like... It's such a good show. I want people to see it. How do I get butts in the seats? Mm -hmm. So this last show was a little bit stressful to produce because I had people drop out and like finding my lineup. And then, you know, I was like, I don't know if I want to do this again. So my initial thought was I wasn't going to do it anymore. But we had such a good show that for now it's on hiatus. I'm putting it on hiatus. And if I bring it back, it'll probably happen like in the summer. Because I think winter's hard. Getting yeah. people out in the winter's hard. Um, and in the summer, I think people are more willing to come out and see stuff. Um, and maybe changing up a day. We were on a Wednesday night. So I think maybe if I can get a Thursday or Friday slot, that might be a little mm -hmm. bit better, better turnout, but it's all about what they have available. So I kind of have to just be open to what they can give me. Gotcha. How many, how many comedians were in the show? So the very first show, I was very ambitious, and I had eight comics on my show for an hour, a 90-minute show, which is okay. actually a lot of comics for such short a time, but when I initially went into this, my initial thought was it was just going to be a one-time show, and if it was going to be a one-time show, I wanted to feature as many comics as I could mm. to give us the opportunity, and I was the host, and I also did a set. Um, so it went really well, like, ladies killed it, it was great. So basically for that show, I gave everybody less time to get everyone in. Mm -hmm. Then for the second show, I decided to have one less comic, so we did seven, including me. But I realized that was a little too much for this time frame, because we ended up holding the house for audience, and then we ended up running over time. Mm. And that, and I, I felt bad, because my closing comic, who was headlining... She was supposed to get 15 minutes, and she only got five. And I felt terrible just because there was another show coming in, and we had to stop the right. show. So this round, I actually found my sweet spot, which is six people. So mm -hmm. five co comedians plus me was just the right amount of time. And so I think for all the future shows, when I bring it back, will be five comedians plus me. Because it gives everyone a little bit more stage time. If we have to hold house or things like that, mm -hmm. there's that leeway. So I'm not, you know, stepping on people's toes. Gotcha. What was your first time on stage like? Uh, on stage stage or like open mic stage? Um, <laughs> stand up different. stage, yeah. Stand we'll up stage, there. okay. So um, I actually got very lucky and was actually performing in my first show after having only done stand up twice. Mm -hmm. It's pretty crazy. I went to this open mic and Perry was like, that was your first time. That was really great. She goes, I thought it was really funny. I'd love to put you on a show. So basically her open mic at the Magnet, they do a monthly show and her lineup filters directly through the open mic. So if you go to the open mic and she thinks you're ready, that's how she picks her lineup for the monthly shows. So she's like, I'd love to put you in a show. I'll give you some feedback mm -hmm. and then, you know, tweak it from there. So I came to the second open mic. I took her notes. I adjusted a little bit. And then she's like, yeah, I'd love to put you in the March show. So by the time I went on stage for the first time, I'd only really done stand up twice but I kind of had worked on my set enough and like I had a pretty good idea from her notes that I kind of vamped it into like a pretty good five minute set. And it was really exciting actually. 10 of my friends came to see my show, which was really awesome. It was fun to see all my friends support me. And uh, it wasn't as bad. I think once you start to find your voice and you get that solid set down, it just becomes easier and easier the more that you do it. So I'm going to say I had a really good first experience on stage. I know not everyone's experience is that way, but mine went really well. I think I just picked a good topic, and I have so many stories, and I'm like, i got to tell these people dating in New York sucks. <laughs> <laughs> so I made some comedy out of it. Gotcha. No, that's what you got to do. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, and it's easier to remember the material when it's happened to you. Yeah, and you know, they, they say it's true. Write what you know. Because yeah. if you watch a lot of comedians... The reasons we relate to them is because most of us have experienced some form of what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. Or if we haven't experienced it directly, we can very much relate to it in another area of our life. Or we've seen it. Or right. we've heard about it. And so I think it's truthful. If you're talking about something that you've actually experienced, you, the audience can feel that. If you're talking about something that maybe isn't as close to home, I think that kind of registers too. Because 
I know not all comics write their own material, but most comics do. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, yeah, they say write what you know because only you can tell your version of this story. And it's, it's, it's for me. So even if someone else did a story about dating, it's going to be very different from my version of dating. Right. So, you know, yeah. <laughs> gotcha. So we'll, we'll rewind a little bit yes. now because you spent a lot of time on stage and in front of cameras yes. before you got into stand. I so did, yes. What, what, um, so you mentioned before that you've been in it your whole life. Um, so well, I started, um, I've been a performer since elementary school, essentially, but I didn't actually start acting until college. Uh, I was in chorus in elementary school, then in middle school I actually did band. Um, I played trombone, and I still can play, though I'm a little rusty, <laughs> but, um, band was actually my life for, for a good chunk of my life, middle okay. school, high school, and college. Um, I was in band, in high school I was in marching band, I did jazz band, I did wind ensemble, and I actually wanted, I was a music major actually my first semester mm. in college, because I had a really amazing band director who inspired me and made me fall in love with that, and I was like, I want to inspire other people and do that as well, and I wanted to be a band director, but one semester of music theory under my belt, and I was like, I don't know if this is the right thing, it was very hard. Right. Uh, and I'd done a few acting classes in high school, but I could never do both band and acting, so decided to take another acting class in college just for fun as an elective when I had changed my major from music to regular education because I'd always loved teaching. And after taking that acting class, I was like, this is fun. <laughs> I think I maybe want to do this instead. And so on a whim, I changed my major and I was like, I don't really know much about this, but I'm going to go for it. And so I just kind of started auditioning and I made friends in theater and like they helped me and I'm I'm very much a fake it till you make it kind of person I think you mm -hmm. kind of have to do that when you start out and I found my way and I I was very behind because I was up against people who'd been doing this since they could practically walk mm -hmm. so it was a little bit intimidating starting so late to me late which now I think it doesn't matter what age you start like it's always going to be there mm -hmm. But at the time, it felt a little bit overwhelming because I was just starting in college and a lot of these kids did high school theater and middle school theater and summer camps and like lived, breathed and they, this was their entire life and I was only just getting into it. So I definitely had a lot of catching up to do, but I fell in love with it and I got bit by that acting bug and here I am. Haven't looked back, so yeah. <laughs> it's been worth it. Yeah. Cool. And you're also producing, the name of it escapes me at the moment. Uh, so I have two films, yes. Yeah. So I have two films that I've produced. Um, the first film, they're both short films, so the first film was called Audition Antics, right. and it's inspired by people I'd met in the audition waiting room in New York City. So it follows a guy in his first audition in New York, and he encounters three of the auditioners in the waiting room, and kind mm -hmm. of, it's what happens in that little six-minute segment, and uh, it's been really fun. I never thought I'd also be filmmaking, so that was also the year that I did see it, but I was like... Let's try this. Yeah. So I'd, wrote, I'd written this script actually a few years prior, and it sat on my computer because I didn't really think I was a writer, and I didn't think anybody would find it funny. So I kind of felt insecure about that. But then I found new inspiration in 2017 to just revisit and approach it from a different place. And so I had a few friends look at it and give me some notes, and I was like, all right, I'm going to make this film. And I'm really glad I did, because for my first film, we just got in, I can't announce it yet, but we just got into our 10th film festival, which has been pretty nice. exciting, and we've nabbed some nominations and awards. We've won Best uh, Comedy, Best Short Comedy, we've been nominated for Best Ensemble a few times, uh, so it's been pretty exciting for, also not knowing anything about filmmaking yeah. was pretty cool to go in. I had a really awesome team. I learned a lot just by failure, and... You, you learn from your mistakes, so that was pretty fun. Then my second film is called Perfect Intervention, like purr, like a cat. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a cat lady. I love cats. I have one cat, but I love all things cats. Mm -hmm. And I had this crazy idea last year watching the show Intervention on Amy, and if you're not familiar with it, it's the show about drug addicts where families stage interventions for them to help them. Mm -hmm. So I was watching it one day, and I thought, wouldn't it be hilarious if somebody staged an intervention for a cat lady? Because you hear the term crazy cat lady, and you hear crazy cat ladies get such a bad rap. You mm -hmm. hear, you know, now granted there are really some crazy cat ladies with 17 cats, and I'm not at that level, but I think whenever someone hears someone loves cats, especially women, we're automatically labeled crazy. 
But it's like, no, it's not any different than someone who loves dogs, but because it's a cat, it's almost like a double standard. So I just kind of wanted to make this film because I had this funny idea and I was like, wouldn't it be funny if somebody did that? And so I wrote a script and was like, what would that look like? And so I turned it into a nine minute short. Um, and we've gotten into our second festival. Our first festival, we also won, or we were nominated for Best Ensemble. So I found I'm good at writing ensemble pieces, which has been a fun thing. So for someone who didn't think they were a writer, and now I've won a few things. So yeah. it's been cool to be like, don't underestimate yourself. I feel like we're our own worst enemy. We self-sabotage. Mm-hmm. Instead of being like, you know what? No, I'm going to try this. And if it sucks, it sucks. But at least I tried. And so that's been fun. Yeah. So venturing into filmmaking has been a whole new side that I did not know. But it's fun. I just need more money. It's very expensive to film. <laughs> yeah. um, and I've self-funded both of my films. I did raise a little bit of money for post-production for my second film, so I used um, Indiegogo was great, but I can't do that all the time. Like, mm-hmm. people are only going to donate money right. so much before they're like, how many <laughs> projects do we have to give you money for? So I don't have any projects coming up that, I've, that I'm that i working on right now, personally, but I'm, I need to get back to the writing board, because I'm like, I haven't written anything in a while, so we'll see what new ideas come to me. Nice. Yeah. What part, is there a part of the filmmaking process from writing to filming that you enjoy the most or more than the others or is it all good? Um, I think the part that I enjoy the most is seeing the finished product and being like, I did that. Like, that's something that I like put my blood, sweat and tears into yeah. and no, and knowing that it's good. Like I, I, not to toot my own horn, but I feel like both of my films are really good projects, and they're both kind of very niche in their own way, but I feel like I've created two really great films, and so I think it's just cool when you see all the pieces come together, like the music composition and the editing and where you started and like having everything fall apart two days mm-hmm. before shoot to now seeing, wow, you have a finished film, and people find it really funny. I think it's really cool to see the end result after you've poured your blood, sweat, and tears into it. Not going to lie, um, being a producer is a little bit stressful. Um, I did not direct both of my projects. That's one too many hats that I don't want to okay. wear. So I did have uh, two separate directors for both of my films. But I was actor, writer, producer. So I did act in both of them and I produced them. But it's a little bit stressful. But I also found that I'm really good at producing. I didn't really know what I was doing. But just doing a little bit of research, I found I like got both of my films um donated like food donated for free on both of my films I found ways just to be really savvy I'm a former couponer so I know how to get a good bargain and I think I just tried to apply that in the process and both films I think from start to finish we produced in like five weeks or less and they're short films so we did one day shoots half day and a full day for both of them Mm -hmm. so it's not like I was doing like six seven eight day shoots these were short films so one day And, um, it's been a lot of fun, but yeah, I definitely had a breakdown from my last (laughs) film on my computer two days before, because the week of my second film, Perfect Intervention, I lost my DP and my sound person the week of my shoot. And, uh, that's not fun. So like having to find a new DP and then found all these people. And then the night before I lost a gaffer. And then I just, I was just really overwhelmed and stressed out that I sat at my computer crying. (laughs) like full on crying my director called and she's like are you okay and I'm like no she's like what's and I was crying she's like what's wrong and I was like it's falling apart and she was like it's fine she's like we we're going tomorrow like don't worry but I was like but it's all so you know sometimes that happens and oh, yeah. sometimes it happens and you know I was very skeleton crew so I don't have a whole lot of money so I couldn't have a full film crew like I would have wanted so mm. I acted as first AD on my second film because I saw what they did on the first film and I was like, oh, I can also do that. And then I learned my lesson. Have people doing the right, like doing the other jobs. Like, I think I just want to focus on producing, acting, and writing and like having someone watching for continuity. Have someone be the first AD for time so you're not also trying to make a PA be that, you know. Mm -hmm. I think I tried for my second film. I tried to combine things and in the end, like, it worked out, but... It shouldn't. I should have just listened to other people. But, you know, you learn from your mistakes, and I now know what not to do. (laughs) Are there places folks can see those two films now? 
So because both of the films are on the festival circuit, unfortunately they are not public until we gotcha. finish our run. I do have a trailer available for my second film. So if somebody wants to look at the trailer, if you go to KeishaPeart.com, that's K-I-S-H-A-P-E-A-R-T.com, under media, you can watch the trailer for Perfect Intervention. Mm -hmm. um, but Audition Antics, we don't have a trailer just because I didn't do it for that. But that one will be publicly available later this year because we're almost done with our festival run. I think okay. probably within the next couple months we'll be done. So hopefully by summer that will be available online. But Perfect Intervention just started its festival run, so that probably won't be available till next year sometime. How did you go about getting your crew? To, were they people you knew? Did you use the online sites and so things like that? So it was a combination of things. So my crew for my first film, my DP was actually somebody I'd met on set a couple of years ago, and I knew he had his own equipment, so I reached out with this idea, and I said, hey, listen, this is what I can offer. Would you be willing to shoot this for me? I was like, it's going to be like a half day shoot, maybe a full day, but I was like, it's only one day, would you be interested? And he was like, yeah, I, I would be happy to help out. And then someone that he works with um, actually reached out and was like, oh, I'd love to help on your film. And he came on as our first AD. And he mm -hmm. actually brought on a lot of the crew. Like he found my PAs for me. He found my first camera. So that's where I found most of my crew. As far as like my director, I got through a recommendation through some friends. I just put a feeler out looking for a director. And I met with her, and we really clicked, and I really liked her ideas, so that's how I found her. And then for my cast, I used a friend that I went to college with, and then everyone else I found through Backstage, which is like an online casting. Gotcha. So basically for the audition antics, we didn't do in-person auditions. We had them self-tape, so I just had them self-tape scenes, and then we did callbacks based on the self-tape. And then we did a rehearsal or two before we shot, and then we shot on the day of. Gotcha. And then the second film, I found a whole new crew and cast. The director for my second film, I had worked on a few projects with through a, recommend, a friend recommendation. And then I happened to find a DP through a Facebook group. I think it's like NYC Filmmakers. Okay. But then we lost the DP because apparently he was aware that I was self-funding and I had a small budget. And when it came down to it... Turns out he wasn't happy with the money that I was paying and, like, mm. waited till the last minute to say this and put me in a bind. But then I ended up finding this really amazing DP. His name is Nolan Roy. Please hire him. He's amazing. Mm. Um, and I had a great sound person recommend recommendation. Um, so I have two. Cheyenne. Um, I can't remember his last name. Sanchez. Cheyenne Sanchez. And then Leo Rosa. Both in the NYC Filmmakers Group. If you guys are in there, please hire them. They're fantastic. Yeah, so I had a rescue crew come. Mm -hmm. And then my cast I found all through Actors Access. So we did, first round was audition sides. And then we had in-person callbacks for that film with my director. And then we did a rehearsal. And then we shot that in a day as well. So now I know people in the filmmaking industry. So this has been cool to learn about that side. Yeah, no, the more people you know the better for any because you never know when something's going to overlap mm -hmm. and you either will benefit you or it right. benefit them you right help them out so yeah the more people you know the better <laughs> yes are you still doing photography i am not doing photography okay. anymore um i was pursuing photography along with acting like maybe two years ago professionally and i was working with a dance company for about two years and then after that happened I just, it's really hard pursuing that career because just like acting, it's like running a full business. And then yeah. it's like, I do waitress in the city, so I have that as a job. And while I was still getting a lot of recommendations, it's, I just didn't have enough clientele coming in. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, I had to really think about, do I want an acting career or a photography career? And I was like, I, I want an acting career. Photography was just something that I was hoping would replace my serving job so that I could ha make right. my money doing art versus waiting tables. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, I have a really nice schedule at my waitressing job. I work three nights a week. And so, and then I just realized, like, why stress myself out? Because it's not what I want to be doing at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but my camera's not completely gone to waste. I basically use my camera for self-tapes. A mm -hmm. lot of auditions now ask for self-tapes. And so I have really good quality self-tapes. And I also gotcha. put people on tape for auditions. So if you're listening to this and you need an audition tape, I do audition taping starting at twenty dollars, and you there can you choose your background. So yeah, so I'm not doing photography. I would say more. It's more so like a hobby now, but I haven't really done much photography. Sad, but yeah. that's the name. That's how it goes. 
they're like they're just decisions. Yeah, that... and you have to figure out like what do you really want? And right. like I I was like oh, I don't, I don't really want this bad enough. I I want to pursue an acting career and a performing career. So mm. something has to take a back seat, but it's not all bad. I definitely learned like a lot of the things I learned during photography is applied to other areas in my life, so it wasn't a complete waste and I I gave it a good shot for a couple years, but it's it's really hard to build any home business, yeah. anything you start from scratch. It takes a long time to really get it up and going. And if you're not putting your all in it, that's going to suffer. And I just wasn't putting my all in it because it's not what I really wanted to be doing. Gotcha. Yeah, I like I had to choose between film and visual art. Mm -hmm. And that was tough, you know, because you, you love being artistic and you want to... You really want to be able to do all of it. Right. You know? We do. But you, it just doesn't... If you try all of it, mm -hmm. nothing will go anywhere. You're just going to burn yourself out. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned your waitressing job. Yeah. I'm curious, does, does that ever find itself into your stand-up? I have yet to do any material about waiting tables. Um, so, no... There are a lot of thoughts I have about waiting tables that I would like to do in stand-up, but I think some things that I would, some things that I would like to say, I don't think would read well with people. Because the thing I've learned about waitressing is, if you've never waited tables in your life, you don't understand that side of it. Mm -hmm. And I, I honestly think it should be a life requirement that everybody should have to wait tables for one day. And I guarantee you, if everybody had to wait tables for mm -hmm. one day. They would be completely different people when they dined out. Right. <laughs> and a lot of people don't understand. Yes, it's not that hard of a job, but it takes a special skill set. And you really have to have a lot of patience and time management. And, you know, some people just should never be allowed to dine in a restaurant. So I don't know if I'd ever put waiting tables into a stand-up set. I feel like we've probably heard it before. Um, and I was like, I don't know if I'd want to put it in, but who knows? You never know. I might be inspired to put something into a new set about waiting tables. <laughs> but so far, I have yet to do that. <laughs> okay. No, I just, I was just curious. Yeah. Because there could, yeah, you said that it's been done. Yeah. So there's that aspect of it. But thinking, without thinking of it too deeply, mm -hmm. just hearing it, it seems like there could be some for fertileness in there. Yeah. Depending I think, on how you crafted it. Yeah, always. depending on how I craft it. Like I've had ideas like like my biggest pet peeve with waiting tables is people who don't tip right. Mm -hmm. Now granted there's a difference between not getting good service because I'm a waitress and if I get bad service I'm I'm still gonna tip but I'm not gonna tip as well as I would if I get great service. But right. if there's nothing wrong, I automatically tip twenty percent no matter what. But there are a lot of people who you know, the 20% tip is a matter of $2, but people will purposely not even tip the 18 to 20% because of whatever they're feeling. And so it's just a little frustrating, and I've gotten into arguments with people that are like, well, if you don't like it, then you shouldn't wait, wait tables anymore. And, you know, I get their argument, but I'm like, I make good money waiting tables, so I'm not going to not wait tables just because I'm upset about that. And we're a pooled house, so it all balances out at the end of the day. Okay. But it's still frustrating. We get people that'll come in and they'll spend $1,000 and they'll tip you $20 and they give you the verbal thank you, like, thank you so much, that was a great service, and give right. you a handshake. And it's like, no, fuck that. <laughs> you, if you can't afford to tip, you can't afford to go out to eat. That is 100% my philosophy. I know there are people that do not agree with me. Mm -hmm. My philosophy, if you don't want to tip, order takeout and pick it up. If you are paying to be served on, then... Unless you unless you really get shitty service, and granted, there are servers who are bad at their jobs, mm -hmm. but most people care about their job. Like, most servers are really good at their job, and we get stomped on all over, you know, because people think we're beneath them, or they think they have better yeah. jobs than us, and that's the thing I've learned is there are people that think I'm beneath them because this is how I choose to make my money, and right. at the end of the day, it all balances out where to where... When someone leaves a shitty tip, someone else leaves a great tip that'll make up for it. Mm -hmm. But it still doesn't make me any less angry when people, like, leave such a shitty tip. More so on larger checks. Like, if it's a $30 check and you don't tip, that's not going to mean as much. But if you're coming in and spending $500, $1,000, and you're tipping me 10%, it's like, I can't pay my bills on 10%. Without tipping, servers can't pay their bills. And a lot of people don't understand we're not salaried. Right. So then, but then people's argument was like, well, then choose a new profession. 
It's like you, it's a losing argument, but yeah, I have a lot of feelings about tipping and it's funny though. Cause my, my uncle uh, tells me all the time. He's like, you know, every time we go out to eat, I always think about you cause you talk about tipping 20% and I was like, oh, that means a lot. So he didn't, they didn't really understand that you should pretty much be tipping 20% unless you truly get bad service. And I've gotten bad service and I'll tip 15% instead of 20. I'm not going right. to not tip them. And from, you know, but I'll never complain unless a server like did something awful. Like I'm not going to go out of my way to complain. My way of saying this was shitty is like you get a 15% tip instead of 20%. And it takes a lot for me to even give you 15%. Like as long as you're doing your job, you're going to get 20% or mm -hmm. more. But I was like, I made an impression on one person. My uncle's like, I always <laughs> think about you when we go out. What would Keisha do? No, so I'm glad good. that I'm glad that I've at least made an impression on one person. So you know, it makes yeah. a difference. It really does. No, absolutely. I've been to restaurants with people who are bad to the waiter or the waitress. Mm -hmm. No nope. deal like, breaker. No, nope. oh, it's terrible. Like I just sink in the chair. If you I, like, were rude, mouth, like, yeah. so if you were rude yeah. to a service worker, if you were rude to a server, a busboy, no. Yeah. Especially like in the dating world, if I'm on a date and you were rude to a server or a busboy, someone, game over. I'm leaving oh, yeah, like, absolutely. that is, that's a deal breaker because it's like, that's also how I choose. Even if I didn't wait tables, it's like, no, you don't treat them that way. Unless, you know, and even if they did something to you that you found upsetting, there's still no reason to talk to people that way. We're all human beings. There are better ways to handle it. But right, there are people that go and they demand, you know, excuse me, you forgot to bring this. And it's like, there's... One of me in seven tables. Yeah. I'm sorry that I forgot. Just remind me, you know, and people don't think of it in that aspect. But you're right. Like, if you're rude to service workers, it's like, no. Yeah, and it is. Like, it's it's <clears throat> partially telling of someone's personality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, you know, can tell a lot. Automatically yeah. about how, if, they're, if they just are nasty mm -hmm. and crappy to the, to the waiter or the waitress. Right. Yeah, so it's sort of, at this point now... A stereotype if you were to look at it in a shallow way mm -hmm. of the performer the actor waiting tables mm -hmm. now my question is do you feel that there's any overlap in the element of like to correct me if I'm wrong because I've never <laughs> waited a table okay I've washed dishes as close as I've come okay um, is there an element of performance there is, yeah. I would 100% there's an element of performance. I mean, you know, you vibe off your tables. Like, when you have a really cool table and you're vibing and you're, like, you know, messing around and you just create this good rapport with them, you know, the, it is a performance element. Um, and then to the other side of that, you know, when you have a table that you walk up and it's like, hi, how are you? Nobody's making eye contact, people are ignoring you. It's a perf it's one of those where it's like, mm, all right, internally I'm thinking, we're going to play this game, great. I'll walk away, I'll be back when you're ready, you know? So it is it is an element of performance. And, you know, I work in Times Square and I work with, like, a lot of fun people. And, like, mm -hmm. so at work we'll all, like, we'll play around with, like, voices or, you know, like, saying, like, you know, we get a, we get a lot of uh, Brazilians at our restaurant and they mm -hmm. love, you know, they always ask for, like, olive oil or Diet Coke and so... We just have to keep ourselves entertained as employees just so we don't lose our insane, our sanity because we work in a very busy restaurant. But I would 100% there is an element of performance. It's like you're you're showing your personality. So the way I greet a table is going to be different than the way you greet a table versus right. someone else. But then it's like how are you how are you feeding off of your table? Like if they're giving you any new you go up and people are like giving it back to you where they're like playing off and it's like, mm -hmm. "Oh, you can play back." And right. then you feel it out, and then you create this rapport with them. And then, you know, then you end up realizing, oh, you're from the same hometown, and oh, man, they know somebody that you know. And then next thing you know, you've, like, made, you know, a lifelong friend. And I've had tables who were like, oh, my God, if you're ever in this town, please come visit me. You were so great. And, and that's the cool part, because we have met. I've met so many fun people. I've actually met a handful of celebrities at my job, Thanks. which is, like, pretty exciting. It's, I fangirl. I definitely fangirl when I see, like, a big celebrity. It's, who, who were some of them? Oh, um, I've met Norm Lewis. I've mm -hmm. met Paula Abdul. I waited on Whoopi Goldberg a couple years oh, ago. Awesome. That was exciting. I saw Viola Davis. I fangirled when I saw her. <laughs> My heart almost dropped. Uh, I've met Will Ferrell. I've met Gloria Gaynor comes in a handful. I've met LL Cool J. Uh, nobody recently, though. But over the years, we've seen like some pretty fun people. And then there are celebrities that come in, and I have no idea who they are. They're like sports celebrities, and I'm like, oh, I don't know who that is, because I don't follow sports, but... 
Like, nor when Norm Lewis came in, someone's like, the guy from Scandal is on table 76. And uh, so I walked down. Someone told me I'm upstairs. I go down, and I was like, you mean Norm Lewis? <laughs> and they all looked at me. And I was like, you guys don't know who Norm Lewis is? Because he's, he's known on Broadway. Gotcha. But in the TV world, a lot of people know him from Scandal. Right. And I fangirled so hard, I went over and I was like, I just, I had to die. And he was the sweetest man. Like, he's like, come here, give me a hug. Let me take a photo. And I was, oh my God, I was so happy. <laughs> That's awesome. I just thought it was funny that they were like, the guy from Scandal. And I was like, you mean Norm Lewis? <laughs> and they were just like, okay, calm down. But I was like, no, you don't understand. I saw him live in Porgy and Bess years ago with Audra McDonald and David Allen Greer, oh, wow. and I could die happy because that performance was brilliant. He's amazing. No, I'm imagine. a huge fan of him. Yeah, but so that's that's like a fun perk. It's like getting to see a celebrity. Cool. So did you did you grow up in the city? Um, I grew up in Orlando, Florida. Actually, I was born okay. in Brooklyn. I lived here till I was about seven, and then um, me and my mom and my brother we moved to New York, or moved to New York, moved to Florida, oh, Orlando, right. and then that's where I spent most of my life. Gotcha. And then I moved back here in twenty twelve. So I've been here for seven and a half years. Okay. So I consider myself a New Yorker now. Yeah. I think I've well, passed born that. here. I was so born like, here, and I feel like once good. you make it over like the five year hump, you can call yourself a New Yorker. Yeah. Some might say earlier than that, but I'm like, if you've survived five years. That's enough of a hump to where you can call yourself a New Yorker. Yeah, I, I think so. And so the elements of that in mm -hmm. your stand-up mm -hmm. come from living down there, of being the, yeah. the Florida material. Yeah, so my new set is about growing up in Orlando, Florida, and essentially being like the token black person. Because, right. I mean, we grew up in a pretty suburban white neighborhood, so there was a, maybe four or five black families, if that. Our next-door neighbors were black, but... Everyone else around was, was white, and then maybe you would see a Spanish family. So right. I didn't grow up in the projects. We were middle class, but like we didn't really grow up in the projects. We didn't grow up around a whole lot of black people. So mm -hmm. that does affect the way you grow up and the way you're brought up and things like that. So, yeah. um, But I, I loved the where I grew up. I loved Florida. I liked where we lived. We had a great house, a great childhood. Could go outside and play. It's nice. It's like kids don't play anymore, but you know, we had that. Mm -hmm. and But I... I very much love my New York life and I think growing up in Florida and having that experience and being here now as an adult, like I truly love my New York life. I have no desire to move back to Florida ever again. <laughs> no desire. And I, when I go home like once a year, my tolerance now is about four days. I usually stay for six, but usually by day four I'm like, all right, I'm a little bored. Yeah. Everybody's moved on with their life. People stop caring about you, sadly. <laughs> Like, when you grow up, like, it's just a life as an adult. Like, the yeah. older you get, if you don't stay in touch with people, people move on. And so I usually go home, I'll see family, I'll see the, like, four friends that will always make time to see me, and then I'll try to go to a theme park, and then I'm like, all right, see you next year. It's yeah. been real. And that's, that's how it goes. But a lot of people come to visit New York, so it's been fun when friends come to visit New York mm -hmm. and I get to play, like, you know, host and, like, show them around. So that's been pretty fun. Cool, cool. So we'll start getting ready to wrap up. Yeah. But before we do, um, talk about what, what's what's going on with you now. Where can people see you? Yeah. What's so that? right now, um, it's kind of slow right now, actually. I do have a stand-up show coming up on February 24th at 7 p.m. Mm -hmm. I believe it's the West End Lounge. Mm -hmm. um, there'll be a lineup. Uh, I don't know how many people will be on that show, but I'll be doing stand-up then. Um, outside of that, right now, I'm in rehearsals for a web series called Complexions that's going to be shooting this spring. Okay. Um, I'm not sure when that will be released. I was just, a uh, web series I shot in this fall just got nominated at the Indie Series Awards, so they'll be taking that. It's called Fabulous, if you can find them on Facebook and on Instagram and on Sika TV. You can watch all five episodes. I'm in the last episode in the series finale. So that's been exciting. We've been nominated for Best Ensemble, so that's exciting. I don't know if, I don't think I'll be able to go to LA for the awards, but mm -hmm. very happy for Victor Album. He's amazing. He's so funny. He created that. And then right now, I'm mostly just, um, I've still got some acceptances, or like I'm waiting on some acceptances for my fil for the film festival circuit. So mm -hmm. um, I'll be doing the film festival in next month, actually. I don't think I can announce it yet. So for now, just if you go to my website, which is keyshapir.com, I keep all this stuff mm -hmm. updated. But yeah, I would say right now, stand-up show February 24th at 7 p.m. in rehearsals for a web series, and you can watch us on Sika TV for Fabulous. 
other than that, I'm just hustling and trying to make some money while yeah. it's here. <laughs> what? So what is Sika TV? Sika TV, it's basically like, um, it, it's like indie, it's like an indie TV channel. So just okay. like you would have like who, like through ma the major channels are like Netflix, Hulu, oh, things like that. Channel? It's a streaming, okay. net, yeah. So cool. Sika TV is streaming, but I believe it's on the internet. So okay. I don't think you can find it on like a Roku or something. Gotcha. But it's on the internet, yeah. Sika TV, it's free. I don't believe it costs any money to watch anything on there. Nice. Um, but yeah, it's cool. Right, awesome. Well, this it was so much fun to see you again, sit yes. down, and catch up a little bit. Thank you for having me. This has been oh, fun. Oh, definitely. <laughs> no, I wasn't gonna like let it. I know we had a lot of scheduling yeah. back and forth mishmash, but I'm so glad we we got it together. Yeah, it was gonna like unless you canceled. Yeah, like, I was gonna drag myself. You're gonna here. you're gonna be like, let's do this. If I had to tie myself to the bus, you were I gonna was, make sure you I got was here. Gonna make sure I got. Well, here. this week worked out perfect, so I'm glad cool. we finally made it happen. <laughs> Definitely. So, yeah, thanks again. Thank and, you. Yeah, I'll put all your info yes. in the video. You can find me on Instagram, at Keisha Peart, and then I'm also on Twitter, but I'm not on Twitter as much. Okay. Same handle, at Keisha Peart, and you can be my fan on Facebook. It's at Keisha Angela Peart, which is my stage name, my middle name added in there. Uh, and go to my website and watch my trailer for Perfect Intervention, because <laughs> it's funny. I love it. I'm very happy with it. So. Thank you all for listening to this episode of the Planet Shivers podcast. You can find this episode and more on YouTube, Spotify, Google Play, iTunes, Apple Podcasts, the podcast app, and anywhere else popular podcasts are found. You can find my work on Instagram at Albert Shivers and on Facebook at Albert Shivers or Albert Shivers Visual Artist. You can find Isaac Wilson's work on Instagram at when underscore in underscore zen. Next week will be a very interesting episode that you will not want to miss. And we will talk to you then.